If you believe that, give God some glory. Take your seats of just a minute. I should be noted that um, the writer of that song is our own pastor of music, Reverend Tyrus Bush. Amen. Bless the Lord. We have been, seems like on a break net speed getting to the end of the year. The months are coming fast. The moments are passing. But I love the word of God. It says God can redeem anything, even time. So the, the, days, the days are evil and designed to cause you to miss your moments. But God is our redeemer. Always brings that opportunity back again. We are heading into, for our church, 90 days of consecration. We started talking to you last week about the 90 day challenge exactly what is the 90-day challenge. I call it get serious. Somebody say it's time to get serious. This just went out. What do we mean by that? I'm challenging you that for the next 90 days, starting the first Sunday in October, that you would renew your commitment and commit to God and yourself that you will be committed to coming to church, to serving God, that you will begin to share your time with God, share your talent with God, Share your resources with God. Because there are some things that we need to get accomplished, not just in this city, but around the world. I wish I had some help in here today. In this 90-day challenge, I'm going to hopefully inspire you to renew your commitment. The word commitment in the New Testament equals our word deposit. I need you to realize in the next 90 days that you're not accidentally here. But God has deposited you in this house. Amen, somebody. So we're going to challenge you to give God your time for the next 90 days. The reason I say 90 days, because if you do it the next 90 days, God is going to do some incredible things in your life. God wants you to give him some of your time. God wants you to share your talent with the ministry. God wants you to share your treasure with the house of God. I'm not getting any help this morning. 90 days of renewed commitment to be in the house of God. To maybe for the first time start coming to Bible study in your life. <laughs> coming to new members discipleship class on Mondays doing things for God that you either did and stopped or never did before I'm going to challenge you to get serious about your commitment over the next 90 days I'm, going, I'm telling you this week because I'm going to give you a week to pray about it and next week all those that have decided to give God their time, their talent and their treasure I'm going to ask you to come to the altar. I'm going to pray for you that over the next 90 days, no matter what happens, you don't let anything deter you, distract you, because God has a response to what you're about to do. 
So October, November, December, it's time to get serious. I'm going to ask all of you to take the dare that you're going to be committed like never before. You're going to give God biblically like never before. You're going to give to missions like never before so we can spread this work around the world. Amen? We've got some wells to dig. It's time for you to volunteer in ministry. Next month, for four Sundays, we'll have a tables in the hallway so you can talk to the people that lead the different ministries and decide what you're going to do for the next 90 days. And I believe once you make that decision, you will never go back. I said you'll never go back. Praise the Lord. So for 90 days, we are going to get serious. Get serious about our living, our giving, our serving. We're going to come to church, somebody say on time. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Repeat after me. On time, on time. Is, late. is late. Repeat after me. Early, Early. Is, on is on time. And late, and late. is not acceptable. Not acceptable. Amen. 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 Somebody say 90 days. 90 days. Ask your neighbor, can you do it? For 90 days. What did they say? What did they say? I want to know, can you do it for 90 days? We have a nation to impact, a city to impact, a world to impact, but we've got to do it together. Amen? Turn to somebody, tell them it starts with you. Tell them again, it starts with you. We're good? Okay. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Church, say amen. Don't y'all start no scandal here. I'm getting dressed, all right? <laughs> I want you to help me welcome a great friend of mine, phenomenal preacher, man of God, known him a long time. Bishop James Woodson is with us this morning. And now that he's here, he might get involved in our 90-day challenge too. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody say 90 days. 90 days. Three, months. Three months. That's not long. So as you pray this week about this, and we know the answer from God is going to be yes. You're going to commit to God. I'm coming to church. Like they're giving away food. I'm going to give to God according to his word. I'm going to shift from giving him a tip to giving him his tithe. Somebody say 90 days. I'm going to volunteer and help the mission go forward. Somebody say 90 days. And we're going to spread this gospel and this work around the world. Somebody say 90 days. Amen. So we're going to, for those of you that feel led, as, you, as, as God, you pray this week and you feel led to help us with these missions, we have to build wells overseas. We have to do micro loans so people can open up those small businesses, those fish businesses, goat businesses, that type of thing. Um, we have to be able to do that for people, but we also have to get water and what's needed to people here. There are some communities in the, in the country, in the United States, that actually need a medical mission. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Where there isn't much help. We have a pastor in Arkansas, and it takes 
30 minutes to get to the nearest hospital. So if you have an emergency and you call, it's going to take 30 minutes for the ambulance to get there and then 30 minutes for the ambulance to go back. Now, if you shot us something, you're in bad shape. Amen. We're going to do some helping. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give God some hand praise. Turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And as you're turning, we want you to know we're so glad that you're here with us today. You have come to what is known as the Transformation Church shifts you in your life from who you used to be to who God called you to be. We have a saying that you might be a caterpillar now, but you will become a butterfly, and you'll never go back to being a caterpillar again. We're here to help you in this walk with God. We want to join hands with you and walk with you spiritually through your life. We want to teach you the Word of God and support you in such a way that whatever your early childhood problems were, we believe together we can lead you out of whatever depression your past has caused, whatever heartache it has caused. We believe that if you join hands with us and allow us to join hands with you, that we will embrace you, love you for real, be that... Uh, go-to place where you know you can get the encouragement. We want to restore the vision God has for your life. We want to make sure that you understand that you have a purpose. We want you to learn why you were created. We want to move with you as God moves us. We want you to become a part of our family so we can love on you, so we can show you what God has in store for you. We're going to reveal to you those things you thought were never possible for you. We're going to show you the way that God has planned for you. We plan to be there when things get rough. We plan to be there when it comes time for you to buy a house. We've got a way for you to get there. When you need medical care, we've got a way for you to get it. When you're troubled in your mind, we're there to talk to you and talk you out of your problem. We're not going to tell you all right like you are, because God has a greater you for you. I wish I had help today. We're here for you, to love you, to befriend you, to walk with you. You no longer have to do life by yourself. I said you no longer have to do life by yourself. No longer do you have to do this thing alone. Let me show you something. Mark chapter 4. Are you there? All right, let's take a look at... Um, let's start at verse 2. And he taught them many things by parable and said unto them in this doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. I don't think I want y'all to see that one. Tell your neighbor, you don't have to do this alone. There's a story in the Bible that says when um, Jesus was in town, there was this man that had this condition and he couldn't help himself. And four of his friends got together and said, we're taking you to Jesus. Because we know clearly he has the answers to your questions. He's got the answer to your mind. He's got the answer to your life. He's got the answer for your sickness. He's got something to do for you that you can't do for yourself. When they get to the house where Jesus is, it's packed. There's a crowd there. Because Jesus draws crowds. So they realized they couldn't get in the door. Now you got to realize they're interceding for this guy because there's four of them carrying him on a bed. 
Somebody say four. four. So they're carrying this man. They get to the door. There's no way they can get in. But in those days, they had ladders going up the side of the house, stairs going up the side, because they liked to go up on the roof and hang out for a while. Well, these four guys decided, I know what we'll do. We're going to go up these stairs with this guy on this bed. Well, they get up to the roof, and the roof is made of tile. So they start plucking up the tiles. Now, Jesus is inside preaching, teaching the word of God. In the middle of a sermon, hay starts to drift down from the ceiling. And the next thing you know, these four guys have gotten rope. And they start lowering this guy to the feet of Jesus. Y'all need to hear what I'm saying. So, so they bracing themselves. And, and when they get him, he's laying at the feet of Jesus. They let go of the ropes because it was their job to get him there. You, you, you didn't hear what I said. It, their assignment was to get him there. I bet you they told him, you don't have to do this by yourself. We'll be your strength. We'll go with you. We'll carry you. We'll intercede for you. You're going to meet Jesus today, and you don't have to do it by yourself. So to get him in there, and Jesus does his thing, you know, because you can't be at the feet of Jesus and he not notice. That's why most people miss the worship moment. When it's really obvious that Jesus is present, you got to get to his feet, what we call the altar. Yeah. You got a hard time thinking about this. Think of the, the stairs as the knuckles in his toes. <laughs> you, you, you can't drop anything in front of anybody and not get their attention. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you. So his friends got the Lord's attention on his behalf. They got him to Jesus. And today, I need you to look at at least three people and tell them, you don't have to do this by yourself. Tell somebody, you don't have to do this by yourself. You don't have to do this by yourself. You don't have to do this by yourself. I'm getting ready to pray for you. If you don't know the Lord, we are so glad your hips up in here today. We are happy that you're here today. Turn to somebody and say, do you know him? Do you know him? Right. We are happy you're here. Now, if you're sitting in a pew with some stuck-up person and they ain't said a word to you all morning, that ain't your fault. They're missing their opportunity. God put them there so you wouldn't have to do this. So you wouldn't have to praise him. You wouldn't have to lift your hands. I'm about to pray for those of you that have never given your life to the Lord. I don't want you feeling some kind of way. All of us were in that position before. Everybody was in that position. But there came a day of decision that I was glad I wasn't by myself. I'm going to pray for those of you that got saved and you're here remarkably in church. Don't feel any kind of way. You've done the right thing. You've come today. Your past doesn't matter. Your future is what we're talking about now. I'm going to pray for you. 
that God move you by his spirit and you come and give your life to the Lord. Because as I'm praying, some of you are going to want to move. I want you to come give me your hand because you know you need to be saved. Some of you know you need to come back to the Lord. You've been messing around a long time, but your time to come back is now. There are those of you that love the Lord, you've been looking for this kind of atmosphere. You didn't think it existed. You thought it only existed on television. But I'm here to tell you today, God has led you here on purpose. God does not do accident. He does not do coincidence. God does not try to do anything. He does all things well. So if you're already saved and you love the Lord, but you've been thirsty for another environment, you've known it for a while. The devil got mad this morning when you heard the voice of the Lord and said, I'm going to Bethany. But somebody shout, I'm here. Stand on your feet for me. If you know the person next to you, grab their hand. If you don't, fold yours. Some of y'all too funny acting for me. Can't come to church funny acting. Repeat after me, Lord. I'm very glad about this hand I'm holding. Now, Lord, I don't know what they need, but I do know this. We all need Jesus. We all need to be saved. We all need a brand new life. I thank you for this hand I'm holding, and I thank you for the promise in your word. We're gathered together. You said you'd be here. Now, Lord, move by your power. Save this hand. Bring this hand back. Settle this hand down. In the name of Jesus, I feel the power of the Lord moving through us right now. And Lord, break every chain. Release the handcuffs. Take the shackles off our feet. Release our minds to know you. Thank you. We're in the whosoever. Thank you. I am the whosoever. Thank you. I'm calling on your name. And this hand shall be saved now in Jesus' name. Loose those hands and give God some glory. If you're coming, come on. If you're coming, come on. Come and come on. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Come give your life to the Lord. Meet me here. Meet me here. Meet me here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where are you? Come. 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 You don't have to walk by yourself. You got some folk that'll carry you all the way here. Just like the men in the Bible. Someone wants to intercede for you. We just prayed for you. Now God wants to move. If that's you, come give me your hand. Let us show you what your new life looks like. Come on, give us your hand. come. You need to be saved for the very first time. You need to come back to God. Doesn't matter how many times you've done it. You know you need a church home. The devil knows. It's time for you to make the decision. If that's you, come. I'm waiting for some people. I don't want you to miss this. 
All you have to do is ask somebody near you, will you please walk with me? Better than that, you may not do that. Turn to somebody and say, let me help you. Turn to somebody else, tell them, let me help you. Reach out your hand to them, tell them, let's go, come on. Tell them, come on, let's go. They just need your help. The man in the text couldn't get there on his own. You may not be able to come on your own. Break through today. Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord of hope, Lord of glory. Thank you, Lord. Come on, here they come. God of hope, Lord of glory. Here they come. Here they come. God of hope, Lord of glory. See the great and mighty is he. Born to bring us victory. Born to bring us victory. God is here with us. Amen. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You give Jesus 90 days from today. Just give him 90. Somebody say, just 90. You'll never go back to your old life. The change will be so strong, you won't want to go back to your old life. 90 days. Give God in this ministry 90 days of your life. You won't go back. I used to say six months, but we're stronger now. You won't go back. Step into the nearest aisle. You need to be saved? Come on. You need to come back to the Lord? Come on. Don't let your past. Here it comes. Don't let your past make you afraid of your future. God has a future for you. Come on now. Come on. Last but not least, you're already a member of another church. But you done got so thirsty you can't. You suspect in the spirit, it's got to be something different for me. If you know God led you here this morning, he does not do coincidence, he does not do accident. If you know he led you here this morning, then God meant for you to hear what I'm about to say. You can go to heaven from here. I said you can go to heaven from here. We're not talking denomination, because holiness is a lifestyle, not a denomination. Pentecost is a dimension in the spirit, not just a denomination. Methodist is just the way they have church. It, we all ought to be good Methodists. Our method ought to be good. We all should be Pentecostal. Wave our hands. Believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. We all ought to be Pentecostal. So holiness is a requirement for God. It's not a denomination in the Bible. So if you been looking for this atmosphere and God has brought you here. It doesn't change. Taste and see that the Lord, he is good. If you know you need a church home today, a place where God is in control, the Holy Ghost has free reign, the Bible is taught and preached, where the power of God is evident, first and people getting saved, backsliders coming back, people uniting with the church, then signs, wonders, and miracles. Normal in God's house. If that's you and you need that kind of home, a place where we're going to teach you the Bible and empower you to live a victorious life, I need you to come.
you're watching us online and you've made a decision, here they come. You made a decision, write us on whatever site you're on. One of our ministry workers will get to you as soon as possible, tell you what the next steps are. Hey, daughter. Why are you this morning? Is there another? We got to move on, but I don't want you to miss the train. Why don't you help me celebrate our new sisters? Born to bring us victory. Take your seats if you can. Somebody say praise the Lord. God is good and he's worthy to be praised. We got some new brothers and sisters today. Amen. Go with me to Titus chapter 1. You've been standing with me a long time. You can keep your seats. We're going to break protocol just a little bit. Amen? Titus chapter 1. Go down to verse 15. As we continue in our series entitled Filters, Filters. You have Titus 1? All right, let's go down to verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Filters. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 13. Second Samuel 13. I'm not going to read all of this, but just enough to give you a sense of where we're headed in our conversation today. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for her sister. In other words, he became obsessed. For she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to deny anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab son of Shemaiah, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle, he was slick. He said unto him, why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Why aren't you eating? So his, his infatuation with Tamar took away his appetite. Wilt thou not tell me? Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Somebody whisper something wrong with that. <laughs> Skip down to verse 8. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it. She made him some bread. Number 9, she cooked it. And then when she brought it to Amnon, he told all the servants to get out. And they went out every man from him. Then Amnon in verse 10 says, bring the food over here. 
Tamar took it over. Hmm. Tell your neighbor something wrong with this. Verse 11, and when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come live with me, my sister. Go to Genesis 38. I won't read anymore because some of y'all might get traumatized. Amen. <laughs> but it's in the Bible. Genesis 38. Don't laugh at me, Woody. <laughs> Genesis 38. Go down to verse 13. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And Tamar, she put her widow's garments off from her, because another one of her husbands had died, covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown, that's another son, that she might have options with, and she was not given unto him to wife. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot. Repeat after me, my life is not defined by one moment. filters. So Titus has this eye-opening conversation with us in uh, Titus verse 1, chapter 1, uh, verse 15 or so, and he says, he says, to people with pure eyes, everything is pure. But to folk that are not pure, defiled, toxic, they can't see good in anything. And what Titus is describing for us is a filter. There have been some things that have happened in our lives that have, if you will, produced a different way of seeing things. Last week I did just a little illustration. I put my sunglasses on. Nothing about you had changed. And as I was talking to you, what we realized is the glasses made you look different to me. And I was looking through a filter that I had acquired. In other words, to make the sunglasses, they have to stain the lens. The lens starts out clear. You can see things as they are. But then, we don't like that. So we asked the optometrist to put some stain on the glasses so we can see things the way we want to see them. I'm talking to the wrong side of church. I, I, I'm clear today that all of us, somebody say all of us, have had things happen in our lives that have created filters in us. Where we don't see things the way we should see them oftentimes. We've got filters on our eyes, filters on our emotion. There's some people sitting right here with us that can't forgive because their filter of rejection is too strong. There's some people sitting here with us today, you can't encourage them because the goodness in the encouragement is filtered out by the time it gets to their heart. There's some of us in here that have had very negative experience with people and it has shaded the way we see everybody. The Bible says to pure, they can see pure, but to the unpure, ain't nothing right. Do you have any relatives that the only time they speak up is when they can find something wrong with something? And they don't realize that you never ask them about positive input. You ask them when you want to see what's wrong with something, because that's all they can see. Now, your silence is kind of telling me that it just might be, turn your neighbor, say you. If, if you know someone that always expects the worst, someone who generalizes about everybody, 
All men are dogs. No, only the ones you had. All women are crazy. No, 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 only the ones you had. So we're talking about filters that affect the way, watch this, we see one another, but it also can impact the way you see God. I know in my own life, I didn't trust God because I didn't have a trustworthy father. And my dad was an absentee father. And I have, I thought, an absentee God. So, I, so, I, so, I, so I, I had my dad filter interfering with my relationship with God. It was hard for me to believe God wouldn't fail you because my own dad had failed me so many times. I'm in, I'm in the wrong building today. Somebody say filter. Filters are created based on your experience based on what you went through in life. No one comes through anything severe without being affected. So it's not about whether we're going to be affected, it's about how long we're going to be affected. I'm not making sense yet to y'all. Y'all, you're not, okay, this is personal. That's why you're being quiet. Some of us had real rough childhoods. Any witnesses in the house? Some of us had parents that provided, but they were crazy as they wanted to be. Y'all too phony for me. Sometimes you had a real good one parent, and the other one was nuts. So you grow up as an adult, you don't trust anybody. Everybody's got to prove themselves to you, but nobody can because your filter is so stained. Is this too personal for y'all? Okay. African Americans wear their filters. We dress a whole lot better than we feel. And we think more is better. So, <laughs> hey man, so it, it's, it's, it's not enough to have hair down to here. Because we think more. I'm going to talk to you whether you don't want me to or not. We can't wear two bracelets. I'm talking about men and women. Got to have them going up our arm. Because we're trying to portray something we're not. If everybody in here had as much money as they look like they had, our appearance is a filter because we don't want you to see the real us. Somebody say filters. We all have them. We all have them. You know anybody just can't be happy for long? Their filter works overtime. You know somebody that has to see the negative in every positive thing? Their filter is on high. Their shield is up. And the problem is told to us in the book. If I'm basically pure, I don't have a problem seeing purity in other people. So optimism is a filter. Pessimism is a filter. Faith is a filter. Unbelief 
is a filter. This making sense? Protect me, Lord. Please, today, deliver me from my negative filter. I want to see stuff like it is. I want to be able to worship you, not over some stuff, but I want you to take it away. Remove my filter. I want to believe you. So, filters can impact relationships. So here goes Tamar. How much time I got? If I stop now, y'all are right. Okay, here we go. So here, so, so, so here goes Tamar, and she's King David's son, daughter, King David's daughter. Now, Absalom is her full brother. Now, the way you're going to remember Absalom is that Absalom was so fine as a man, and his hair was so wonderful. They used to weigh his hair every year just to celebrate how good looking he was. <laughs> Y'all know who Absalom is. But you got to be careful with Absalom because some folk can't handle a lot of praise. But that's another story. So, so Amnon, the half-brother to Tamar, is in love with his sister. Somebody say something wrong with that. I didn't say he loved her. I said he was. So he's so in love, he thinks. Because if he loved her, for real, even if he felt it, he wouldn't do it. But this stuff usually happens around somebody you trust. I'm in the quietest church in America today. So he fakes sick. So his sister will come see him. And he claims, now watch this, he claims, can nobody make bread like she can? Now you got to understand, the king chef cooks for Amnon. So Amnon's eating from the best chef in the kingdom. But, but Amnon's made up his mind, I know how to get over here. And I know she got a good heart. And she says, you know what? I don't even understand the request because I'm not that good a cook. So she's real about it. It's in the Bible. You can read it. So, 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 because Amnon is her brother, she goes to see him. So, she cooks the bread at his house. Because after all, he's the king's son. Hmm. So, y'all getting this? So, so, so she gets there, he watches them make the bread, but he, he's faking because he's acting like he can't get out to bed. So, 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 so she finishes making the bread, the house smells like bread, he laying on the bed, and he does one of these numbers. Why don't you bring the bread over here? So she, so she, so she, you know, she, she don't feel right. She, she, some, something's, something's hinky. She like, eh, something wrong with this. Now, I ain't heard he this sick. He got the best cook in the kingdom. And then after she gets there and finishes the bread, he puts all the servants out of the room. But Tamar wants to trust him. Because after all, they got different baby mamas, but they got the same. 
So she thinks the same daddy should protect her. Watch out. Is this making sense to you yet? You go ahead and read it when you get home. So, 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 so he does the thing. She comes over. He said, now, she said, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It don't have to be like this. You, ain't, you don't have to do this. If you ask the king, he'll give you to him. But Amnon don't want her that way. He gets a kick out of taking. Giving doesn't excite him. It's in the Bible. So, now up to now, the Bible is clear. She's a virgin. She don't have an experience of this. But she can't cook, which should have been, used to be a good sign that a woman could be a good wife. If she could burn, you was halfway there. So girlfriend comes in and she, she don't have no cookbook. She, Betty Crocker wasn't around and she started whipping up the bread. And she says, wow, this is turning out real good, but something's wrong with this environment I'm in. So he does the thing. She pleads with him, no. She's being hurt by somebody she should trust. We get to Genesis, and like the Bible often does, they show us her reaction to what they show us in the Bible later. She has already gone through two bad marriages in Genesis. Because she got a problem with the way she sees herself. She doesn't choose who she wants. It's chosen for her and she always accepts the wrong thing. Man, I got everybody's attention. So she's hunting for another husband. Because she thinks... This one will be the one. The reason she can't handle a relationship is because the situation with Amnon gave her a relationship filter. So she doesn't think she's worthy of anybody the king assigns to her. I'm almost there. So she hears that her father-in-law is going to buy some sheep. He's going to the market. So watch what the moment did to her. Your life is not in a moment. So girlfriend, Because she want to have her way now, and the only thing she feels is of value is her sexuality. Because the wrong decisions early on can cause you to think, man or woman, that the only commodity you have is your body. I can hear a rat pissing on cotton this morning. Watch how this works. Y'all just guess, yeah, excuse me. Y'all come back, you'll get used to me. You'll get used to me. You'll get used to me. So Tamar's trauma gives her permission. Her filter gives her permission to see, to dress up like a hooker, behave like a hooker, 
because she thinks her whole life is wrapped up in that moment. How many of us sitting here been suffering because our daddy left us? Because mama gave us away. Got your whole life wrapped up in one moment. So girlfriend dresses like a hooker. Put the thing over her face, got a veil. Sitting on the corner. And here come the father-in-law. Fast forward. They make the deal. They do the deal. She gets pregnant. But the father-in-law is not like a lot of guys. Because, you know, they, they, they didn't, she didn't get money. She got some things that represent him. She gave him some jewelry. He gave her jewelry and gave her his staff. And he offered her a sheep, but she said, no, nah, we ain't going for that. He said, I'll send you a sheep later. He said, no, no, it's pay on delivery. It's in your Bible. So he goes on about his business. She takes off her stuff, goes back to being Tamar again. So she wasn't really a hooker. She was playing one. But she was acting like one too because she gave herself away for nothing that represents the way God sees her. My design is for you to get the filters off so you can see yourself the way God sees you. So some of these options that we've taken in the past are no longer options for you. The drugs won't be an option. Running the street will not be an option anymore. God wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. And your whole life is not defined for a negative season that you went through. Is anybody hearing me? Your past negative is not who you are. You see, arranging these marriages, they inadvertently passed her around. And then when she got by herself, she started passing herself. God, I hope I'm getting through to somebody. That moment that God brought you through does not define your whole life. That mistake you made does not define your whole life. That failure you had does not define your whole life. I'm out of time, but I'm certainly not out of time. That's the introduction. Girl, we got to get out of here. Repeat after me. A moment does not define my life. Stand on your feet for me. God wants to change your future. But there is a moment that will define you. See, Absalom got offended for his sister. And Absalom was convinced that if he killed Amnon, Tamar would feel better. Absalom thought if he killed Amnon, he would feel better about what happened to his sister. So Amnon had the right idea, but the wrong person. 
There's only one person that can die for you and make a difference. His name is not Amnon. His name is Jesus. He will change that moment into a testimony. I got to ask you one more time. If you need your life changed, it's time to come to the Lord now. He died so you wouldn't have to go through this the rest of your life. If a moment has defined your life, it doesn't have to. Jesus died to change your moment. If that's you, come. We don't want you to miss your moment. Amnon thought she would feel better if somebody killed. Tamar thought she would feel better if somebody killed Amnon. After it was over, she didn't feel better. Because only Jesus, who died in anticipation, will change that negative moment into a testimony no one will believe. She finally gets what she wants. The right relationship, her own kids. She gets everything she wants. But her filters cause a lot of trouble in her life. Somebody say, Lord, Lord. please help me with my filters. Please. Take your seats for just a second. It's offering time in the house of God. As you're preparing to give, most people don't understand that when we give, we trigger God. The book of Deuteronomy gives us some instructions that we got to give from our heart. That means we have to give honestly to God. We have to give with a desire to please him. A desire that he would be satisfied with what we're doing. He wants the righteous side of us to propel us to give to him. God says, I get triggered when you give. He says, not only am I going to bless the work of your hands, everything you try to do. I'm going to bless you on your job. I'll bless your business. He puts it like this, I'll bless everywhere your foot touches. I love the fact that God gives us permission to trigger him. And this is what we do now. You don't have to wait till the first Sunday in October to get triggered now. You can begin to do what God is, you already know what God wants you to do. Somebody say, from the heart. Be honest. Trigger God. The Word of God is designed to make a response happen in us. Because God responds to behavior that is a fruit of His Word position ourselves. He says, bring me the tithe of all that you get, that tenth of everything that we receive. He said, and bring me an offering. The tithe opens the windows. The offering dictates the pouring out. Some saints, they say, well, I tithe, and that's all I do. Well, you got open windows, but you got empty pockets. It's time to trigger the Lord, trigger heaven. So God can do what he promised himself he wants to do for you and I. As you're ready to give, as you're ready watching us online, I need you to stand in this room. As you're ready to give, I want you to stand. While you're standing, I want to invite you out to the Embrace class tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Pastor teaches that class. If you're locked in by your schedule, you... Pastor Nick teaches the class on Tuesday morning online. If you can't make either one of those, and Prescott or Pastor Nick teaches the class on Saturday morning. So you have no excuse. We've got availability. Amen? Somebody say start tomorrow. 
So I'm like, uh-uh, start now. Start now. Ready to give? Say amen. amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you once again for this tremendous opportunity. I always marvel at the fact that you, you never ask us for something you haven't already given us. So the test is not testing you. The test is un whether we understand how easy you're trying to make things. Thank you for giving us what you ask us for. So now, Lord, we understand clearly that's why you say we have to give from our hearts, from honesty, from generosity, because you've already given us the very thing you're asking us for. Help us not to be unbelieving, but help us to have faith that you say in Deuteronomy that if I give to you from the heart, it will cause your hand to move on our behalf. And we thank you in advance for what you're doing right now. Thank you for the seeds we already possess that are proof of a harvest we've already received. We bless your name now. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody walking, everybody giving, please. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you took the time to join us today for the Encounter Worship Experience here at Bethany Church in Lindenwald, New Jersey. What an honor it has been for me to share with you a word that I believe will make a difference way down in your heart. That will cause your soul to shift, your mind to understand that you don't have to be chained to a negative moment, a negative event in your life. I give God praise for you today and for your attention. And I need you to write me to tell me where this word touched you. And understand that Christ knew his audience. He said, I've come to free those that have been made captive by the things that have happened in their life. And I am indeed glad that you joined us today. And I have faith, I'm confident that this word will make a difference in your life. All of us have filters. You can also call them strongholds, as defined in the New Testament. And God wants to bring them down. He wants to remove the stain from the way we see, the way we feel, the way we conduct ourselves. So today is the day that's the beginning. It starts with you, my brother, my sister, as God removes the filters. I hope you joined us today in our worship and our giving. And if you haven't given yet, why don't you move by faith? Show God your heart your thankfulness, your gratitude for everything he's done in your life. He makes it so easy. He gives it to us and then he asks us for it. He gave Abraham and Sarah Isaac and then he asked them for it. And there was a greater covenant attached to him giving Isaac his son, something precious to him from his heart. Well, I hope I see you on Wednesday night. If you become a member of our internet church, our our, our, our virtual church called Connections Church. If you're locked out geographically from us and you desire to be a member of our church, write us on the site. Connections uh, ministers will get to you, show you the next, next steps you have to take. Now remember this, faith acts like a thing is so, even when it's not so, that it might be so. God bless you. I'll see you next time for the encounter here at Bethany Church in the New Orleans, New Jersey. We are the Transformation Church. See you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock.